Good morning, class. Today we're going to talk about um, solubility and factors affecting solubility. So we're going to look at some terms here. You've probably heard some of these before at least, saturated, unsaturated, and supersaturated. And what these are is in relation to how much solute we can dissolve in something. So you've already seen this, even though you probably haven't thought about it, that some things are more soluble in uh, certain things than others. Let's look at water. We know we can dissolve quite a bit of salt in water or quite a bit of sugar in water. We know that if you add sand to water, it's not really soluble. So the amount of solute you could get to dissolve there is much lower. And all those solutes are uh, specific in how soluble they are. So we can get so many grams of sodium chloride to dissolve in, say, a glass of water, or so many grams of sugar, etc. So whatever that maximum amount is that we can get to dissolve, let's say it's 10 grams of sodium chloride. If we have less than that, then we have what's called an unsaturated solution. If we're right at that mark, if we have exactly 10 grams of sodium chloride dissolved in our water, then we're saturated. And sometimes we can kind of play with things, tweak them very carefully, control our conditions. We can actually get more solute to dissolve in that substance than what we normally would be able to. And in that case, we have a supersaturated solution. So how can we do that? Well, one of the things that affects solubility is temperature. If we increase the temperature, we should be able to make something more soluble. And you've probably seen that. If you have a cup of hot coffee or tea, you can get a lot more sugar to dissolve in that. Um, so what we can do sometimes is if we can play with the pressure or the temperature and get it to a place where it will it'll hold a lot more of that solute, and then if we very, very carefully bring those conditions back, if we heat this up and we get a lot of, say, sugar dissolved in this, and then we slowly, carefully bring the temperature down, we can potentially keep all of that solute dissolved and make a supersaturated solution. Now, like it says here, supersaturated solutions are extremely unstable. So not only do we have to be careful with how we lower that temperature, but then if we do anything else to that, if I add a little bit more solute or I shake that container or whatever, we're probably suddenly gonna see all of that, that extra solute, the part that made it supersaturated, coming out of solution. It's gonna precipitate out or crash out. And here's an example of that. We have this container of sodium acetate. It's super saturated and they, they drop one extra crystal in here and all of a sudden you see because of that disturbance, all the solution crashes out. And that crystal that they added is gonna act like a seed crystal actually that the other or the crystallization can occur around. So because of this, instead of even just getting that to fall out as a powder, we get these really nice crystals to form. And that's how a lot of ways, if we need crystals it, for a certain uh, part of chemistry, if we synthesize something, we created something, and we need to look at what's, what is the crystal structure. We have to go run that through x-ray crystallography. We have to make a really nice crystal. And this is one of the ways they'll do that sometimes. Here's another example. You've probably seen rock candy before. This is actually how they make rock candy. They're gonna make a super saturated solution of sugar, and then they're gonna uh, essentially disturb that super saturated solution and get these sugar crystals to form. In this case, around those sticks, sort of using that stick like a seed crystal. We've talked about everything's temperature dependent. The higher we bring up the temperature, the more we should get those solids to dissolve because we're giving them more energy. The enthalpy of solution is endothermic, means it, meaning it requires energy. So if we increase the temperature, we give it more energy, we increase the ability for it to dissolve. We're gonna look at some solubility curves here. So solubility curves tell us how soluble is something in specific units. In this case, grams of solute in 100 grams of water. So how soluble is that? What mass of that can we get to dissolve? 10 grams, 30 grams, 80 grams, whatever. And then related to the temperature. So how does that solubility change as we increase the temperature? And you'll notice for the vast majority of these, the solubility increases. And some of them increase very, very, very quickly. Others increase very, very slowly relative to temperature. And that's gonna depend on a whole bunch of factors. How many ions do we have? What size are they? What's how strong is their charge, et cetera. Um, but this is something you should be able to recognize and read. Again, we're not going to have to make you draw any of these. We're not going to have you, you know, memorize the shapes. But let's say we're looking at potassium chloride here, that dark blue line. And we asked you, um, you know, how much uh, soda, potassium chloride could we get to dissolve in water at 80 degrees? So in that case, you'd look at the 80 degrees right here and you'd go over and you'd say, oh, we could get about 52 grams of potassium chloride to dissolve in 100 grams of water. Or if I told you, hey, I have 
uh, 40 grams of potassium chloride dissolved in 100 grams of water at 30 degrees Celsius. Is that solution unsaturated, saturated, or supersaturated? So if you go here, you said, well, you told us that we had 40 grams dissolved and it's at 30 degrees. Well, that line mark right there is actually above the line. So that would be supersaturated. So that's some of the ways you could use solubility curves, some of the types of questions you might see. And here's that purification again by recrystallization. So if we had a mixture of substances, multiple solids dissolved, we might be able to purify it by getting one of those things to crystallize out of there. Or like I said, a lot of times making these crystals is important for chemists so they can further classify what that material is. Um, Gases are also soluble. Um, something you know, probably we talked about a little bit. Obviously, we couldn't have soda pop if they weren't soluble in water. We're dissolving CO2 gas in water. Hydrochloric acid, usually you think of it as a, a liquid, you can pour on something, but that HCl is actually a gas. And what we do is we bubble that through water to create that hydrochloric acid solution that we have. Well, gases are a little bit different because they're so energetic, because they don't uh, experience a lot of intermolecular attractive forces, it's hard to get them to dissolve in water. And we'll actually have the opposite thing happen that we have for the, the solids. If we increase the temperature, we're going to see more and more of the sol uh, solvent going into the vapor phase. Uh, and the same thing with the solute. We'll actually decrease the solubility of the gases if we increase the temperature. Um, here's an example of that. Pouring soda pop, we have cold soda pop, you'll notice very few bubbles, very little of that CO2 is escaping. Whereas with warm soda pop, a lot of the CO2 now is escaping. It's uh, much less soluble in that soda solution. So a solution is saturated in both nitrogen gas and potassium bromide at 75 degrees C. When the solution is cooled to room temperature, what is most likely to happen? So we're well above room temperature, which is usually 22, 25 degrees, and we have both a gas and a solid dissolved. It's saturated. It can't hold anymore. So do you think we're going to have that gas bubbling out of solution as we cool it, some of the solid precipitating out of the solution, both or nothing? Well, in this case, because of the temperature and the gas, we'll probably actually see that the nitrogen gas might become more soluble, but what we are gonna see is that solid precipitating out of solution since we were already saturated and we had a warm solution as we cool it, some of that uh, solid is gonna come out of solution. Here's a pressure dependence. Same thing, we can play with the pressure, we can play with that solubility. And for this with a gas, if we have more pressure, we have the molecules pushing down harder and harder and harder, so we'll actually increase the solubility of that gas because it's gonna have to work harder against that pressure to come out. So if we have a soda can closed up, high pressure in that headspace, CO2 is very soluble. Open it up, pressure decreases because now it's open to the atmosphere and some of that CO2 is gonna come out of the solution a lot more easily. Henry's law. This relates to the solubility of a gas. You don't have to memorize any of these constants. You have the constants in this slideshow. You also have these constants in your book in this chapter that you can review to. But you look at the uh, equation for Henry's law, really just two variables, either the solubility of the gas or the pressure of the gas. And then there's the Henry's law constant right there. So you would have to be given two of those three things, be able to find the constant or be given it and say you know the pressure of the gas, then you can find how solubility, soluble it is, or vice versa. And you'll notice the units for Henry's law are molarity per atmosphere. So if we were to just grab a sample problem, let's say you were told we had um, O2 gas at 800 torr, and we want to know what's the solubility of that O2 in molarity. How much can we get to dissolve? So we're going to go, we're going to look at the uh, Henry's law constant for that. And that for oxygen is 1.3 times 10 to the negative three. And pay close attention to the units. This is molarities per atmosphere. So we need our pressure to be in atmosphere. So that's going to be our first step is we're going to take that 800 torr, we're going to divide by 760, to, or we'll write it out this way. Uh, one atmosphere is 760 torr. So torr cancel. What we see is that should be 
five, three atmospheres. So now I can take my Henry's law constant. Times the pressure in atmospheres. That's going to cancel. And we should see that this is 0 0.00137 molar or molarities of that um, O2 gas, which makes sense. It's a gas. We're not going to be able to get a lot of it dissolved. We're never rarely going to be able to get a super concentrated uh, gas solution in, in some liquid or in water in this case. But that's how you utilize that Henry's Law equation, like I said. The other example you could see is um, being given the solubility and having to find the pressure. But just two components there, um, not a lot to that equation. Last thing then, conceptual question. Uh, examine the Henry's Law constants on table 14.4. Why is the constant for ammonia larger than the others? So there's our ammonia right there. You'll notice the constant is quite a bit larger. And here's everything else, O2, N2, CO2, and helium. Why is ammonia's constant larger? Because it's polar and the other substances are nonpolar. Because it has the highest molar mass compared to everything else on the table. Or because it's nonpolar and the other substances are polar. Well, if you think about um, ammonia, we've got nitrogen right here. It's got a lone pair of electrons and then we have those three hydrogens and it's actually going to push all three of those hydrogens down. We're going to have a trigonal pyramidal shape and because the electrons are up here we get a partial negative charge at the top of that pyramid and a partial positive charge at the bottom. So it's actually quite polar and then because of that the others you'll notice are very nonpolar. It should have the largest Henry's law constant because of that polarity, because of that intermolecular attractive force. Um, so that's everything in this part. Uh, hope it was interesting, and I'll see you in the next one for concentrations. All right, au revoir. -y.